Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Paul J. in Baltimore. Our next guest says that shadow banking has surpa surpassed traditional banking, both in scope and significance to the economy, and risk to the economy, both in the 2008 crisis and continuing risk. Now joining us to talk about all of this is Jennifer Taub. She's an associate law professor at the Vermont Law School. She also works with SAFER, and she joins us now from Amherst, Massachusetts, where she's at the Perry Institute. Thanks for joining us, Jennifer. Thank you for having me here, Paul. So first of all, tell us what you mean by shadow banking, and then we'll get into why you think it's so risky. Sure. Uh, to best describe shadow banking, it's helpful to first define what we're talking about when we talk about traditional banking. And so by traditional banking, I'm referring to an intermediation or middleman function. This is where an institution takes in deposits from savers and channels those into loans to either consumers or into the commercial sector. That would be traditional banking. With shadow banking, this intermediary, this intermediation function is served by something other than a bank or by a portion of a traditional bank. And what, what, what is done there, though, is it's still the channeling of savings um, into loans, but instead of using deposits that are FDIC insured, what is used is just other short-term liabilities, very short-term borrowing, very often through what's known as the repo market, which is very short-term, sometimes overnight loans, multi-trillions of dollars that can be brought in to these middleman institutions and loaned to investment banks and to others, but just as quickly pulled away, creating incredible vulnerabilities. And it was the run on the shadow banking system that actually brought down both Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers as those institutions financed up to half of the assets on their balance sheet in these very short-term, sometimes overnight loans. And when they weren't able to roll over those loans, meaning renew them in the morning, uh, they faced uh, immediate collapse. And I should add that it's not simply that the institution, an institution like Bayer or Lehman faced collapse, but it was through the shadow banking type liabilities. Instead of you know, one by one you know, consumer deposits, it was through these wholesale giant, uh, giant loans that can so, be, so easily be pulled. The, the folks on the other side of the loans, of course, were concerned about their own wherewithal. And this is how the domino effects of one institution failing can, can kind of multiply out. And they, they start to not trust each other's books. Right. So this is what people meant by a crisis of confidence. It wasn't simply confidence. It was the fact that the, an institution that's highly leveraged that has borrowed let's say $97 for every $100 in assets, you know, as you can see, with that, if, every, if the value of your assets shrink just by 3%, um, you would be insolvent. So any hint of trouble with a highly leveraged institution, those lenders to the institution will quickly pull their, their money. In contrast with traditional banking, because we have in place deposit insurance, there's less of a threat, it's still there, but less of a threat of a run because depositors understand that they can be made whole. Um, in addition, with traditional banking, um, traditional banks are required to put on reserve a certain portion of deposits that they can't use for lending, and they also have access to um, emergency loans from the Fed. So all these systems were in place to protect traditional banking, and with these protections came, though, regulatory oversight. Again, the, the sort of safety and soundness um, requirements um, controlling and regulating what banks were supposed to be doing with depositors' liabilities. So these, these are the stress tests. It's not, it's partially, the, it's the stress test and it's the ongoing visits from the banking regulators. And what we had leading up to the financial crisis were vulnerabilities in traditional banking um, as well as this massively growing shadow banking system that was serving as a connector between investment banks that were supposed to be able to, uh, under capitalism, uh, either, uh, either thrive or fail. Um, but because of the interconnections of these banks, we, the, the government did this unprecedented intervention supporting not just 
um, traditional banks, but also shadow banks, the giant investment banks, and rescuing them, rescuing other parts of the shadow banking system, such as money market funds, all these institutions that were unregulated and supposed to uh, survive on their own or fail on their own simply because they were connected to the protected pieces of the system, to the traditional banks, and thereby also connected out into the commercial sector. So the banks are arguing that they, they need this kind of flexibility to move massive amounts of capital around the globe because that's the nature of the global economy now. And if they can't do this, then the global economy starts to freeze up. So they need the freedom to do this, and they've learned their lesson. It won't happen again, and we're told there's enough regulation in place that too big to fail can't happen again, and, and life is rosy. Is, is that your interpretation? Well, my interpretation um, is not so much of that PR spin that folks who want to keep the system as it is so they can you know, privatize their profits and socialize their, their losses, what they will say, I tend to be a, a more evidence-based in how I look at the financial system today. And so it's, it's as if you, know, if, if, a, if you went on an exercise regime, you might want to have some metrics for before and after um, the program to see whether your health actually improved. And if you just check on a few of those metrics from before the crisis to after the crisis, it sure looks to me that the same conditions that resulted in this, these massive interventions and the collapse of the financial system still persist. And what I would look at um, is this question of too big to fail and too interconnected to fail. And if you look at the preamble to the Dodd-Frank Act, which was designed um, to help reform the financial sector and also protect consumers, if you look at the preamble, one of the focuses is on ending uh, too big to fail banking um, so that we end taxpayer funded bailouts. But if you look at the question of size alone, um, back in uh, right before the crisis, if you look at the top five financial institutions, look at their assets on their balance sheet, these top five had assets equivalent to 50% of GDP. Now, let's fast forward to 2011, three years after the crisis, and the same, it, it, you look at the top five institutions that survived then, and their assets were equal to 58% of GDP. So we can see that we have um, larger and more concentrated institutions. Um, in addition, when we look at concentration, take a look at the top 10 largest financial firms before the crisis, and the top 10 accounted for 55% of all industry assets. In 2011, it was 65%. So in terms of size and concentration, we have bigger institutions. That alone should cause concern. It reminds me of the justification for the massive multi-trillion dollar upfront and backdoor bailouts. You might recall the, the, there are many justifications. And one metaphor that I thought was particularly telling was something that uh, Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke said in the summer of 2009, and he said that we had um, intervened not to help the big firms, but, and this is a quote, when the elephant falls down, all the grass gets crushed as well. And looking back right now, four years after the uh, financial meltdown, I see a lot of crushed grass around me, but I observe that the elephants have gotten much larger. And in addition to that concern about size and concentration um, is this concern, again, about leverage, interconnection, and this the size of shadow banking. In particular, given that it was the run on repo, the run on these overnight loans at Bear and Lehman that precipitated the crisis, and going back a few years, actually allowed these firms to load up on high-risk, hard-to-price assets. Given the problems there, one would think that that would have been addressed, and it still has not been. The repo markets, um, it's, it's not very, it's not, um, there are different ways to measure the size of these markets, but most recently, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, looking at both the repo market as well as the reverse repo market, this, um, it, they estimate it's at over $5 trillion.
Now, these, this is, again, very short-term, sometimes overnight funding. And the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is still quite concerned about the, the vulnerability there. Also, in terms of leverage, the Dodd-Frank Act did not do enough to require the largest institutions, both the giant banks as well as the non-bank, the so-called shadow banks, did not, the, the, the act did not do enough to require them to have cushions to absorb their own losses. And we're, though the banks will say we are less leveraged now than we were before, the law doesn't require um, substantially more equity capital than it did before. It's still um, about 4%. And that will ramp up. They're required to have more of a cushion to the extent they're considered to be um, riskier institutions. But we have not really had, we have not had a single non-bank financial institution designated as systemically important. So there, we still have a whole host of shadow banks, including hedge funds and the like, that can operate at giant sizes with extreme leverage and create vulnerabilities um, should they should they fail. Well, in part two of this interview, let's go further and we'll talk about are these institutions still too big to fail and is the risk any less than it was in 2008? So please join us for part two of our interview with Jennifer Tull.